Greetings, dear friends, to a welcome to another session of our uh, uh, Tozer series, our Attributes of God series, our Show Me Your Glory series of, of ordinary time uh, in this 2020 calendar year. Uh, this has been marvelous for me. My meditations have been sweet, as the psalmist says. I've learned so much as I've done nothing but just simply think about God. Uh, this is a major part of our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. Recall that John 17, 3 says that this is eternal life, that they may know you uh, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We, we have eternal life. is not some abstract thing. It's a relational thing based on our knowing our God and his Son through the power of his Spirit. Now, today we look at something related to our last session, which was on the self-existence of God. A concept that is very close to that is the self-sufficiency of God. God's self-sufficiency is directly related to his self-existence because he has life in himself. He doesn't need anything else. Everything that he, everything that he, he has, he needs. Uh, and we were able to look at that in that glorious uh, name of Yahweh. I am who I am. That which speaks to his completeness in himself now will logically and, and very wonderfully arise this concept, the self-sufficiency of God. Because God is almighty, because he exists in himself, because he needs nothing else he is absolutely not dependent on anything or anyone, the self-sufficiency of God. Now, the critical thing in sort of understanding any of this is understanding the Bible. The Bible is God's own self-revelation. We sort of know who the Lord is on the basis of him revealing himself to us. It's not something that we just... You can't just sit down and start thinking and, and all of a sudden we'll logically arrive to all the truth about God. You don't know God in God's self, uh, that awkward language that I had to use in the grad school. Uh, God in God's self is only known to himself and to those that he will choose to re relate himself to. As a matter of fact, we have to think rightly about God. Tozer, in uh, chapter 6 of his book, uh, The Knowledge of the Holy, the chapter on the self-sufficiency of God, he says to be right, we have to think worthily of God. I love that. Worthily of God. Our thoughts should be on the same level and on par of what he's revealed to us. To be right, we must think worthily of God. It is morally imperative that we purge from our minds all ignoble concepts of the deity and let him be the God in our minds that he is in the universe. There should be a correspondence between who God says he is and what you think he is, <laughs> which means you have to work at it. You can't just, it's not automatic. You're not just going to be able to say, I'll just let it go. And I'm good. It won't work. You have to, you have to, Find out what he says about himself in the scripture. And then you need to conform your thoughts to that line of revelation that he provides uh, in the Bible. Now, this was the heart of what, uh, what I shared in the previous session. Moses in front of the burning bush. It gives this very awesome picture. Uh, God speaking out of the bush, speaking of himself, speaking to Moses and of his people. This is a very clear revelation of God. This isn't something Moses just thought about. He didn't unroll a scroll and ponder. God came to him and spoke to him, and Moses heard about it. Dear friends, that is the way self-sufficiency is. Self-sufficiency is something entirely non-creature-like. <laughs> I'm totally uh, dependent on all kinds of things, and I, I admit that. The older I get, the clearer it is to me. God, however, is self-sufficient. Everything that he needs, 
Everything he needs to be, he has in himself. Now, we think oftentimes we have a goal, we lay out a plan, and we put the pieces down, and we pursue it. That's just the way we have been raised. That's the way we think. We want a garden. You get all the stuff for the garden. You prepare for the garden, plant the stuff, uh, you water it, and then months later, voila, a garden. <laughs> it's what you do. It's what you put on yourself. It's your work. Uh, and you, you can be self-sufficient. Oftentimes, in sort of in sort of Bible circles, you have people who know that they're not sufficient. And they've got all kinds of things that need to be pulled up by God. And so they just ask God, please, God, just, just pull out this, that, and the other nail of sin, of error, of, of, of jeopardy that I have. Just take them all out. Just do it well. It's like this one, uh, one, one site, this one Christian teacher said, when we let go of our control, God pries loose <laughs> our self-sufficiency one nail at a time, and we are set free. Oh, my goodness, that's not very encouraging to me. I mean, one nail at a time? That's, that's not a good metaphor. Let me give you a better one. Uh, there, were, there were a bunch of deacons in a Bible study, and one of the deacons, you know, in, in, in uh, Bible study and prayer, and one of the deacons was praying, and he said, Lord, please eliminate all the cobwebs in my life. You know, and, and what, how, do, how do we eliminate the many cobwebs? All the errors and mistakes, the misjudgments, the sins, all the things that make me weak, make me vulnerable, which make me fragile. How do I get rid of all that? I mean, you know, is it prying? <laughs> God, prying a single nail at a time, prying is, is it's, it's a terrible thing. Well, God's, God's way is totally different. God kills the spider. If he can kill the spider, then you, the cobwebs will take care of himself. He has to, you and I have to die to ourselves. You have to admit that you are as weak and pathetic and fragile as you actually are. Because if the spider is taken care of, quite literally, all the webs will be too. It's more efficient. <laughs> it's a better way. This is why we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, yet not us, but Christ lives within us. So how can we, so dependent on our own wisdom and strength, how can, how can people like the likes of us ever truly understand the self-sufficiency of God? I mean, how? Well, uh, thankfully, in the Bible, Jesus said that his grace is sufficient for us. For his grace, his strength, his enablement, his, his uh, undeserved favor is perfected when we're weakest. Praise God. I need that verse. Second Corinthians 12, 9. His grace is perfected in weakness. So the weaker that I, I am, the more I admit it, then the more his all-sufficient grace can be true for me. So here's the principle today that I will begin in and try to shortly unpack. God is the supreme being. You've heard that phrase before. It's a great phrase. Of all beings and all the beings that need anything, God is the supreme being. He's giving being and life to all, and yet he possesses no need for anything. He gets nothing from the other beings that he ascribes being to. He upholds all things, but is held up by no one. He's the upholder. He is not the upheld. God gives life, and yet he has no need for any. This idea, we're going to sort of unpack in Psalm chapter 50, verses 7 through 15. And as normal, we'll look at the facts, try to look at this paragraph, interpret it carefully. We'll draw out a principle or two, and then we'll see how we can apply and make this our own. Uh, let's begin with the facts of Psalm 50, verses 7 through 15. 
The first three verses in that paragraph, verses seven through nine, I have entitled, uh, I am your God. This, by the way, is God is speaking to his people. It's one of these very wonderful uh, and not altogether rare, but it's not very common to have God himself speaking in one of the Psalms. Uh, uh, God will talk about himself and make a case over against his people in the way he sees himself in verses 7 through 9 of Psalm 50. This is how it reads in the English Standard. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt uh, offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your foal. Listen to how God starts that. Hear, O my people, I will speak, O Israel, I will testify against you. This is a word against this people. I am your God. I am God. And not for all the sacrifices do I rebuke you. You give me enough of those, but I'm not accepting anything that you provide. It's a very bold and straightforward uh, testimony of God against his people. He, he opens this paragraph with a call for them to hear. Here I will testify against you. I am God. I am your God. I've got something to say. And then the Lord says, I am not interested in the multitude of sacrifices that you give to me. That is simply not important. Your sacrifices will not be accepted. As a matter of fact, I have plenty of those. I'm not, I'm not rebuking you because you don't sacrifice. As a matter of fact, you guys sacrifice a lot. <laughs> you give me all kinds of stuff. But I'm not going to pay any attention to any of your bulls or your goats. This uh, God, is, God is honing an argument. And he begins with what I'm sure the people thought is precisely what God wanted. God wants our ceremonies. God wants our sacrifices. Hey, we give God plenty of those. We give God sacrifice. We're good. Everything's fine. God says, look, I'm not rebuking you for a lack of sacrifice. You've got that. But, but I'm not going to accept your bulls and your goats. I'm not. And that is, in fact, a, a common thing especially at the end, right before Judah uh, went into exile under punishment by God, God would tell them very clearly that he was not accepting their, their sacrifices. He wanted them rather, as Isaiah 118 says, come now, let us reason together, the Lord, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come, let us reason. God doesn't. God is not static. You don't just give God stuff. You read the Bible. You go to church. You do this, and that's it. You just check it off. God is fine. God says, "Come. Why don't we reason together? Why don't we think about this together? Let's talk about who you are and what you're doing. Uh, though you're, and if we do, though your sins are like scarlet, they're going to be white as snow. Though they're crimson, red." Uh, they're going to become as white as wool. God says this all the time. God, God had no problem in actually talking to his people about all the different things that they had done and, and what he wanted to, them to do. Uh, he testified to them a lot. In Malachi 3 verse 5, he says, Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely against those who oppress the hard worker and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Do you see what he is getting at in this rebuke, this testimony, uh, as he testifies against his people? It's not just the, it's not the rote sacrifices that they were giving. He was concerned. He wanted to reason with them about their actual deeds and the way they the way they, they treated the widow and the fatherless uh, and the sojourner, 
the way they they were engaged in sorcery and adultery and in in false swearing and in oppression of hard workers. God, when he testifies, he goes right to the heart of the things that concern him. And what's important in Psalm 50 is God establishes, I am not going to accept your bulls and goats. Don't try to play me. I am not interested in your sacrifice. For us today, it would be like our Bible reading or uh, going to church or, you know, giving a tithe or an offering, something like that. God is not interested in those things alone. Uh, I love what, what, what Tozer says on this issue of sacrifice. He says, since God is the supreme being over all, it follows that God cannot be elevated. Our sacrifices aren't like helping God. God isn't like weaker, then you give him sacrifice, then he's built up. No, nope. he it follows, if he's supreme, it follows that nothing we give him can elevate him. Nothing uh, going on with Tozer, nothing is above him, nothing beyond him. Any motion in his direction is elevation for the creature. Away from him is descent. Do you see what he's saying? <laughs> Anytime you approach God, it builds up all the best capacities, resources, and characteristics that you have. When you, when you detract from him, all that you were meant to be, you begin to descend. You lose your luster. We're like the moon, not the sun. We can only reflect his glory. And then the last sentence in his quote, as, as no one can promote him, no one can degrade him. Your sacrifices are not the thing that God needs from you in order to feel better about himself or some crazy notion we, we, we've generated. God is sufficient. He is full. He is supreme. He is self-sufficient. For uh, Psalm 51 puts this, put it this way on sacrifice. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Could anything be that direct and clear? All the offerings, there were, there were, there were a half dozen, the meal offering, the grain offering, the burnt offering, the trespass offering. There were, there were all of these offerings that were given, each one to be given in a certain way. The psalmist, David here says, you will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Verse 17, Psalm 51, the sacrifices, the real sacrifices of God are broken spirit a broken and contrite heart. Now, oh God, you will not despise that. That's what he wants. The sacrifices of God are internal. It's not bulls and goats. It's not just things that you do. God needs your inner life to be a rightly related to him. And when it is, you will have a broken and contrite heart. So that's the first thing God says. I I don't need your sacrifices. He goes then to say, to the, to the next part, I own everything. Everything, look, I am your God. The next point he makes in the paragraph, I own it all. God's testimony, he, he first sort of decries his people's sort of naivete about himself. And then the second thing, in the second uh, group of verses, he will give a testimony of his complete self-sufficiency. Here's the text, Psalm 50, 10 through 13. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills. I know them. <laughs> and all that moves in the field is mine, all that moves. If I were hungry, I think this is the only way you can read this. <laughs> if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. For the world in its fullness is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? God, God is here saying that because I am the maker and creator, because everything derives its life from me, I don't need anything you got. Everything you have, I gave you. Do you honestly believe that there's anything you could do that I need, that if I'm hungry, I'm going to give you a call? <laughs> oh, I love that about the Lord. He is so clear. He says, all the beasts and the cattle 
are mine. He said, all birds of the hills and everything that creeps and moves in the field, those things are mine too. Therefore, quite literally, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you about it. I mean, if I needed something, you're the last one to hear about that <laughs> because I don't need what you have. For the world in all its fullness is mine. Now, of course, the heaven of heavens is, belongs to the Lord, but he's speaking to us. He's trying to tell you something. He's trying to get across an idea that you need to understand. Dear friends, in and of yourself, there's nothing that you have that God needs. Now, th does God want you to praise him? Does he acknowledge your worship and obedience? Does he love your faith and honor your prayers? Yes, 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 and yes. But does God need that? Does, is God like waiting on you to give him something so he can be elevated and be more of who he is in himself? No. No, no, no. He says, if, I'm, if I were hungry, I wouldn't ask you about it uh, because everything in the world and all of its fullness is mine. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 reiterates this point. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the, the, the rivers. The earth is is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. This is uh, Tozer, he puts on this. Uh, because God owns it all, he's complete in himself. To admit, Tozer says, the existence of a need in God is to admit incompleteness in the divine being. Need is a creature word. I, I need all kinds of things. I need air, I need food, I need water, I need love, I need friendship. I have a lot of needs, and I know that. I, but need, Tozer said, is a creature word. It cannot be spoken of the creator. God has a voluntary relation to everything he has made. God wants to relate to you, but he has no necessary relationship to you or anything else outside of himself. This is important to know. God will relate to you. He loves you. He wants you to know him, but don't you think for a second that there's anything in and of yourself that God needs. He has no necessary relation with anyone or anything outside of himself. Everything that God gives is gracious, loving, hospitable, and generous. It's, he just doesn't need us. He doesn't need you. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell any of you guys about it. And that leads us to the final part of this psalm this paragraph, not only is he God, not only does he own it all, he offers, he, he then now says, you need, because of who I am, you need to offer your all to me. God then gives him a command and a promise in verses 14 and 15 of Psalm 50. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon him in the day of trouble and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. There are, there are three commands, two promises. Offer to God a, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. Offer, perform, call. And God said, I will deliver, and then you will glorify me. It's really wonderful. God sort of closes this on his self-sufficiency. If God is all sufficient, then what would what should we do at all? I mean, I mean, what does that mean? If he doesn't need us, then what what the heck? Why, why, why do anything? God says, wait, hold it, stop. Offer to, offer to your God thanksgiving. Offer to me thanksgiving. Keep your vows, perform your vows to the most high, and call upon him in the day of trouble. This is show your dependence on me. You are, not, you are dependent on who I am, and then what I will do, I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. So it's, it's, it's marvelous. God says, God, God, God brings us into to relation to himself. I love this. Oh, uh, Psalm, Psalm 116, 
uh, verses 16 through 19 says, O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maid servant. You have loosed my bonds. The, the all-sufficient one who needs nothing, he has delivered me. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people. You see those same three things. Offer to God thanksgiving, pay your vows to the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, is where I will do it. Praise the Lord. Well, the toes are on this point again says, whatever God is and all that God is, he is in himself. All life is in and from God. That's why we thank him. Whether, whether it be the lowest form of unconscious life, a ladybug, a roly-poly, <laughs> or the highly self-conscious intelligent life of a seraph, the most brilliant, powerful creatures that God has made, no matter what, a roly-poly or the archangel Gabriel, no creature has life in itself, not one. It is a gift from this almighty God. What, what, a, what a great idea. Now, how should we interpret this passage? It's pretty clear. God is sufficient in himself. Just, that's it. That's what the Psalms, psalmist said. That's what God said in the psalm. As the creator of all things, he is neither in need of or dependent on anything or anyone. Because he is self-existent, our God the true God is also self-sufficient. For as the Father has life in himself, Jesus said in John 5, so he has granted to the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. The Father and the Son has life in themselves. They have life as a result of who they are. So what is the principle? As the author of life, as the all-sufficient one, who grants being to all other beings, he sustains his creation while being utterly beyond it. Our God will never need anything. Uh, this is hard for us to think about. <laughs> uh, it's just not very easy to think about a person who doesn't need anything, especially when I'm up to my nose hairs and all kinds of stuff I need every day. I need rest. I need food. I need just think of, go through the list of your own mind of the things that you need. I love, David was acknowledging in a prayer before his people this very thing, and, he, and, he, and he, he makes this clear in a wonderful prayer he gives in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 29, verses 14 through 16. He says, but who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to thus, be able thus to offer willingly? They had come together with all this great offering to help build the temple. He said, what, what are we that we should be able to offer all this? For all things come from you, the self-sufficiency of God. And of your own, we have given you. We've just simply given you what you gave to us. <clears throat> Verse 15, for we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. We die. We're going to die. We're, we're tiny. We're needy. Oh, Lord, our God, verse 16, all this abundance that we have provided for building your house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. This is really significant. Uh, I am convinced that to sort of get this, to make this truth our own more than anything we have, to, we have to come to grips with ourselves. There's no way you can study God without looking at yourself. Uh, it's one thing to say, oh yeah, I recognize that God is all sufficient, all supreme. He is fully capable. He needs nothing or, or no one. But you have to think about what this means for yourself. We, yes, how do we make this truth our own? I need, Don needs to recognize God's supremacy and then offer to him what he's already and graciously given to me. He gave me a voice, I can give it back to him. He gave me a heart, I can surrender it now to him. He gave me members and 
I can ambulate. I can walk around. I can use my body now for him. Everything that he has given to me, I can offer back willing to, to, willingly to him, knowing that it came from him in the first place. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-three 23 says, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All your offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. It's just the natural thing to do. Fear the Lord, praise him, offer to him, stand in awe of him. Tozer again, he says, how can, he, he, he talks about this, how can we live a fulfilled life? He says, uh, in the meantime, our inner fulfillment, he, he's talking about all these things in this part of the chapter. And then he says, okay, how on earth do we make sense of God's self-sufficiency? Then he says, in the meantime, meanwhile, our inner fulfillment lies in loving obedience to the commandment of Christ and the inspired admonition of his apostles. It is God who has to work in us what we give back. That's what's so smart. It is God which works in you. He needs no one. And check this. He says, but when faith is present, he works through anyone. He needs no one, but when someone trusts in him and depends on him, God will work through that person. And then he closes his quote. Tozer says, two statements are in this sentence, and a healthy spiritual life requires that we accept both. We have to obey him, and though he doesn't need us, we have to trust in him, and he will work through us. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, David can say in Psalm 34, 3. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. This, this is the pattern of God working. We magnify him. We seek him. He answers us and delivers us, and we give him praise. What is our importance? This is how Tozer says Man's only claim to importance, the, the only claim a man or woman can have to being important is that he or she was created in the divine image. In ourselves, we are simply nothing. We, we are nothing. Without him, we don't know a thing. That's why, that, that is why, dear friends, I hope that you will have some time to think through this again, this what the Bible says about God and his self-sufficiency, about our own, our own crazy tendencies to try to, to try to map out our lives based on our own puny little ideas. God is the supreme being, however, giving being and life to all, and yet he possesses no need for anything or anyone. He upholds all things and yet he is held up by no one. The one thing about the self-sufficiency of God is that in everything he does, we can know that he's enough. There's nothing I'm going to ever face that the Lord isn't sufficient. Our God is sufficient for anything. Uh, he made me. He remade me. <laughs> I've been twice born here in Wichita. Uh, it's an amazing thing. I was born to my, my folks. And yet he, he gave me life again through faith in his son. Every single day that I've ever had before and after repenting and believing in him, I've needed him. I'll never, I'll never live a moment without drawing from what he provides. And now the smartest thing I can do is simply offer to him thanksgiving perform my vows to him and call upon him in the day of trouble and he will deliver me and I will glorify him. What a wonderful truth to know that our God is God and he is sufficient for everything, more than enough in everything that we go through. May the Lord this week, may the Lord for the rest of your life <laughs> give you true insight into the self-sufficiency of our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.